Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Our Homes Ending the Housing Crisis. Today, we're joined by Paul Brubaker. He is the principal of TZ Economics, a Hawaii consultancy doing corporate work, development impact analysis, and litigation support. His background is in research on the Hawaii economy and in country risk and financial risk analytics from 25 years as a commercial bank economist. He's here to share with us the latest data about the Hawaii housing market in the wake of the pandemic. A couple more housekeeping announcements. You can type your questions into the chat feature of this webinar. And uh, Paul has graciously agreed to share his slides with anyone requesting a copy. So just reach out to us and let us know if you would like a copy of the slides afterwards. All right, Paul, welcome and please um, take it away. Well, hi everybody. Um, I realized the, the slides I have include some appendices that I'll probably cut out. So the PDF version I'll send over to um, Teresa at um, the end of the hour. And then, and then we'll know what I actually showed as well. Um, and I think the plan is to maybe spend 20, 30 minutes on this material and then uh, move on to um, more in-depth dis discussion. So I'll, I'll try to follow that plan. And uh, here we go. Thanks again for the invitation to participate. It's, it's been a while. Um, I followed your uh, um, career at the ledge, of course, uh, Senator Chang, with interest. and. Um, Appreciate the opportunity. It was several years ago, but you had me open at a housing discussion from which I had to leave right after my discussion and wasn't able to hear the other speakers, although I, I heard there was a lot of feedback. So I had to, I had to go to the neighbor lines for something on that occasion. So hopefully I'll get a bit more, uh, uh, you know, back and forth with you and, and bounce some ideas around that will um, in, in inform the, the audience and, and maybe have time to take some of their questions. So um, just, just a reminder, you know, the title, we picked this title, what's, you know, what's been going on during and after the pandemic. And of course, after the pandemic is kind of like, uh, well, is it really after? So this, um, this uh, it's XBB, right? The new variant that's taken over, not, not the whatever, but the, um, I was just looking at the, death number, death counts today, COVID death counts. And it's, it's one a person, uh, it's one person a day now in Hawaii, which doesn't make the news. Somebody is killed by COVID every day in Hawaii. So let's, let's just remember it's, yeah, maybe the worst of the pandemic is over and most of us have acquired immunity through vaccination or maybe an exposure or two. And uh, I think we're doing, you know, we're in good shape but it's still out there and it's still affecting economic activity. And the, the thing we wanna talk about today is how it might've affected the housing market. And, and what I'll try to do is bring that into a longer term historical focus in terms of other ways the economy has changed over years and decades. But you know, we're just talking about the last couple of years now because three, almost three years ago exactly. In fact, it was about this time three years ago to, I think if I recall correctly, a Japanese visitor had been in Hawaii, went back to Japan, turned out they got back and they got tested and turned out they had COVID. And, and uh, I see I have the wrong date in the footnote here. These are data through January, mid-January 2023. But this um, tourist, he and his wife, I gather, had picked up, well, they must have picked up COVID here unless they had it the whole time they were here, in which case they were spreading it around if only asymptomatically. The point is that was that was three years ago, and the news I recall at the time was that well, that's not that doesn't count because you know we don't have any. I remember the LG, you know, who's now the governor, saying, "Well, we don't have any confirmed cases," and I was kind of like, "Yeah, bro, that's because we're not testing." <laughs> so our first case came. Uh, uh, the announcement came on Friday, March sixth, and almost contemporaneously, you see this jump in. Now these are Google searches on the phrase um, "working from home." which is kind of what I want uh, us to think about in terms of the housing context. So if you index to the peak search volume, which is back in March, April of 2020, when a lot of us were working at home, index that to 100, the index pre-COVID was about seven, <clears throat> seven or eight. And after methodological revisions, uh, it has settled, but it settled at a, a, a level twice or maybe not three times anymore, but you know, roughly twice what it was pre-COVID. So that's kind of interesting. People still searching on this phrase, working from home, and it speaks some 
to something that act as has changed the nature of uh, work and workplaces and the spatial pattern of uh, housing uh, demand and presumably lodging demand. Nobody's talking about that. I, I talked about it with the, the tourism people a couple of weeks ago. So pre-COVID, what we know is that from nationwide data, there were there are no Hawaii data, but nationwide, actually there's a little Hawaii data I'll refer to in a second, but essentially 90% of people almost never or never worked from home pre-COVID. And those who worked from home full-time comprised less than 4% of the workforce. So maybe about 10% worked from home, uh, maybe one or two days a week, maybe three days, but less than 4% worked full-time. And now we have these really great surveys post-COVID, uh, the Census Bureau and Bureau of Labor Statistics, the, these, um, you know, national, federal statistical agencies jumped into into trying to measure this these changes, which is amazing because usually it takes years or decades for them to work out new surveys, and they're doing all this from home, by the way. So we have this one survey that shows in the fall of last year, basically the last six months of 2022, about 20 to 25 25 percent of respondents to the Census uh, Household Pulse Survey, about 20 to 25 percent of respondents said they teleworked or worked from home in the last seven days. That's not full-time or part-time or hybrid or whatever, but we know that at least one day a week they work from home. And we have other surveys. This is from the American Community Survey, which is, hasn't has yet to be published for 2022, but this speaks to the point I was making a second ago that a very little pre-COVID data, but what we do have suggests that about 5% in the ACS, the American community survey, 5% of respondents uh, said they worked from home pre-COVID and, and then it was 11% uh, after, uh, in 2021, a, a big jump, which I think is gonna end up staying at that level. Another survey question asks, what, how much time does it take for you to commute? And over the last decade, you can see it rose from 25 to 28 minutes. And that's just queuing theory, right? There's, there's a certain amount of bandwidth and these multi-lane divided highways and roadways, uh, that dropped to 25 minutes uh, as of 2021. And, and it probably will continue to go up over time because the bandwidth hasn't, they're not gonna build another freeway ever again in Hawaii. But um, this step function on the teleworking side probably jumped and, and there, you know, this is full time, we don't know, but maybe 10 to 20%, maybe as much as 25% of people are working from home at least part time. And I'd hazard to guess that this ACS data set suggests that you know about 5% of people work from home almost all the time and now it's double that. If you look at what occupations are most likely to work at home, obviously if you are in a customer um, facing um, position, occupation, or in a kind of activity that requires to be on the job. So if you're in food preparation or farming or construction, maintenance, transportation, down at the bottom of the list, you have very low participation and then up where the nerds live and computer and math, legal skills, finance, right? Science and engineering and so on, management. Uh, those activities, right? So those occupations uh, tend to be able to take advantage of the ability to work remotely. And, and there's an interesting paper being presented at UH right now, I'm missing it, in the econ department. You should go check it out at the University of Hawaii Manoa Department of Economics Sem seminar, a professor from Washington University in St. Louis is presenting a paper showing, if I understand the, the abstract correctly, that you know we think of the machines and the people and this question about are they substitutes or are they complements, right? Is, is AI a substitute for you or is it a complement to you? Well, it kind of sort of depends on whether you can use you know, the capability of the, of the machines. But this um, professor uh, and, and co-author distinguish between the equipment and the software part of investment. We, we, we have data on you know, residential investment, uh, commercial investment, and in buildings and structures, and then equipment and software, and show some evidence that, that the machines tend to be complementary, right? You need the machine to work on the construction site. You need the machine to plow the field. You need the machine to engage in the food preparation. But the software can be a substitute. And what we know is that if you haven't 
acquired the skills to use the software, and that's basically a function of educational attainment, it may be a substitute for you, for you, the person, rather than a complement that enhances your productivity. And so some of that, we're all still discovering what's going on here in this, um, in the wake of the pandemic, how productivity might have been altered. And of course, the software is continuing to change this new, the new AI technology, right? To, um, are they calling it generative or something like that? Anyway, that allows you to not just search on a phrase and find places to go look for information, but actually search on a concept and have the AI um, bot develop the um, develop the answer, help develop the answer for you. You still have to decide. So by occupation, you see this pattern, you see it by industry. The industries with highest remote work participation, finance, insurance, professional, technical services. And at the bottom of the list, the ones we were thinking about before, accommodation and food services where you need to be on the site, agriculture, construction, and so on, retail trade. Overall, what we see in Hawaii, and unfortunately, Google was publishing these data and they stopped at the end of October, but we can clearly see from residents' smartphone movement, smartphone mobility data. So, you know, the Google knows where your smartphone is. Everybody knows where your smartphone is. And relative to the pre-COVID benchmark, so starting with January 2020 as the benchmark for how much time you spent at home and how much time you spent in a workplace, you can see the pattern that happened after the onset of COVID in the, in the late winter spring of 2020. Initially, a big shift away from time spent in work, 50% decline in time spent in workplaces and 20% increase in the amount of time spent at home. But you can see that now three years later, it's subsided into what's looking like a persistent pattern that the change is permanent or it has a permanent component. We're not going back to the pre-COVID norm. People spend about 25 or 30% less time in the workplace on average. This is, these are Hawaii residents' data from Hawaii residents' cell phones or their cell phones spend 30% less time in workplaces and 5% more time at home. And as they say, that's beginning to look like it's a permanent change, which has permanent implications for how much office space we need, how much retail space we need. Does the mall really, have you been doing Amazon instead of going to the mall, right? And more time at home and spillover effects. So for example, it turns out, I don't know if people appreciate it as much as we do now that we have these data sets, but the pattern of utilization of retail and recreational establishments, retail food service, recreational establishments, mirrored workplace utilization in the sense it dropped after the initial pandemic event, and then it recovered, but it too, the, the utilization of these spaces, retail food service and recreational establishments like gyms is about 20% lower, 30% less time in workplaces, 20% less time in these, uh, you know, attendant, establishments because we stopped there on the way home from work and we're not going to the workplace the way we did, or some people aren't going the way we used to. So as I say, a permanent change, you've heard long COVID, there's a literature on what the, the authors cleverly called long social distancing. So we, we engaged in social distancing three years ago and now many people are permanently, or you know, some people certainly in certain skill, occupational areas, certain industries, and only about 40% in these surveys, the, the authors of these papers have conducted, only about 40% of workers have completely returned to the pre-COVID workplace. 30% have substantially returned. So maybe 70% have gone back, excuse me, but another 10, 20, even 30% either don't go back, haven't gone back to the pre-COVID workplace or, or um, only do so part-time. And this hybrid work environment that we've seen emerge is really important, not just because of utilization of residential versus commercial uh, real estate, but in terms of the commuting times we were looking at, the commute, you know, um, uh, uh, average commute time we were looking at earlier in the data. And this is a global phenomenon. So the survey after survey is showing that, that you know, people maybe in the, in the in the groups there where people could work remotely, maybe one day a week they did, they worked away from a traditional workplace, conventional workplace pre-COVID and 
and now it's two days, something like that. And people are willing to pay not to have to go, go, go into the workplace, go into the office or, you know, basically waste time uh, commuting or have more time uh, to be with their families. And as I say, there is both a permanent residual component. We're not going back in economics is called an hysteresis, which is a change you thought might be temporary, which turns out to be permanent or have a permanent component. And it does seem to be associated with higher productivity. Although productivity has collapsed more recently, there is some really compelling data that uh, there was at least a one-time productivity um, jolt, uh, increase as a result of the, of, the, of the shift to remote work. In terms of housing and real estate, there's a debate. So the initial impact is think of a wave coming out from the, from the urban core to the suburbs and exurbs and Zoom towns where housing preferences uh, shifted away from these conurbations where you have agglomerations of you know, work environments like a resort area like Waikiki or a downtown or a campus like Manoa, uh, you know, the harbor area. Um, and more recently, a bit of a backwash as, the, as housing demand moved radiated outward from the urban core, it created a shift in the differential between suburban and urban core housing prices that made the urban core less expensive relative to the suburbs. And because of certain lifestyle characteristics and so on, there's an age distribution effect as well. So the, you know, the young professionals maybe had a, a window to move back into the, into the city. So these things have changed at least permanently, at least in some portion of the workforce, maybe 10 to 20% of the workforce. And so let's talk about housing. Um, everybody's aware that home prices went up for a while, now they're coming down. Um, I'm not sure everybody's as aware that on Oahu at least, virtually all of this increase occurred in the single family home market segment. And to a lesser extent, I can demonstrate this for the neighbor islands as well. On the neighbor islands, the resort markets dominate the condo inventory. So it's not as helpful an indication. In Honolulu, condos tend to be, and multifamily dwellings uh, more generally, tend to be either within the urban core or in you know, agglomerations um, near um, interchanges or, or bus stops or you know, that kind of thing. But clearly the Oahu data, after you seasonally adjust the median price data, both single family and condominium, condominium prices on Oahu had relatively stable rates of appreciation in the 20 teens, about four or 5%, maybe more like 6% on the neighbor islands. That may be a longer term equilibrium. We could look at that. but. Um, I could, I, mean, I could show you that, but this post-COVID bubble was kind of freaking people out. And I, I skipped over this. There are at least a, a paper or two suggesting that significant portion of home price appreciation over the 2020 through 2021 or 2022 interval was associated with remote work. Why? Because single family homes are detached dwellings. You have removal from the infectious disease risk that remains present or more likely to be a risk factor in a multifamily you know, housing environment where you get on the elevator with people and so on. Um, and of course, most recently now with the Fed having to jump on inflation with higher interest rates, we've seen those prices come down. But this pattern of the donut effect to which some uh, uh, analysts refer, where the demand sort of radiated outward from the urban core. You can see clearly in the 2020 home price appreciation data on Oahu, North Shore, East Honolulu, Windward Oahu, Makakilo, Mililani, um, right, those, Wahiawa, those were the sort of the outer burbs, if you will, um, saw you know higher rates of price appreciation than the urban core down at the bottom of the list there, Kapahulu, you know, uh, sort of right up and down, um, you know, King Street, uh, Bertania, uh, Kapilani, Alamana corridors. Whereas in 2022, this backwash came where, because the, right, look, look at what happens when single family prices jump over a million, over 1.1 million for the median single family home and condos simply regain the path they were on 
and had begun to drift off pre-COVID, right? Condos basically hit back on the equilibrium trajectory, but single family prices jump 10 or 20% over that path. That makes the condo and urban core prices relatively low and it's relative prices that matter. So the initial donut effect with demand going out to the burbs and then this backwash coming in last year. Well, the whole thing's been crushed now by interest rates, we'll talk about it in a second. And the whole thing may be a one-time shift, but the point is that changes in the structure of the workplace, the workforce, some of which have a permanent component, have permanently changed the pattern of housing demand. And certainly if you start thinking about attributes of housing, right? If you're working at home, you can't sit around the kitchen table for the rest of your life working, right? You need a, you need a workspace. And if you used to have an office or a cube downtown, right? The incredible shrinking cubicle in downtown Honolulu, and it's been vacant for three years, why would your employer pay rent for vacant space? So that's all unraveling right now in various ways we can talk about in the, in the discussion, the Q&A. There are other longer term trends. And I wanna point out one that DBED drew attention to back in the, in the mid 20 teens, what I call in the sort of new urbanism, a period of the 20 teens where we, we started, you know, there was a renaissance in urban core uh, condominium development. And um, so comparing a half century ago or more, a time of statehood, 1960, in 1960, about 60% of households were married families with children. Dude, I was there. I was one of the children. There were kids everywhere, bro. There's just like kids everywhere. 60% of households in Hawaii in 1960 comprised married families with children. Today, it's a quarter. Today, there are as many households where persons live alone as there are households with married families that have children. That's a completely different kind of housing market and you would need more housing units just for those people that are now living alone whose shares of the housing market, uh, shares of the household total in Hawaii have doubled, right? These are women who in 1960, they could even get a job, not to mention become VP. And now not only are they an executive, they divorced that sorry ass loser of a husband they had and they have a nice condo somewhere or older people that are able to and prefer to live independently. And let's face it, for whom, you know, group housing has, hasn't been the most healthy environment the last few years. But at any rate, the point here is that both short-term and long-term structural changes, if you think through them, point to a need for more housing, even if the population isn't growing, which it has been until recently. And we need to worry about that because I'm pretty sure it's not growing because people are bailing because they can't find housing. But also structural changes just happening in the short run, in this case, since the pandemic began. So if you have this feeling like, you, you, you know, you're, you're young, but uh, starting to be reasonably successful and thinking about, you know, uh, buying a home and maybe raising a family or, you know, finding a new path with your partner, you're kind of stuck in, in, in as a legacy of what we've been doing in Hawaii for the last several decades. So let's, let's just clear away a couple of myths and then I want to show you the, the hard data. And the hard data, it's hard. So you're going to save some time for this. First of all, most of the diminution of affordability in the last year has come from interest rate increases. So I'm sorry if you missed out, but for a decade, we had one of the most affordable periods in Honolulu history. I know for the last 10 years, everybody's talking about the affordable housing crisis, but I'm not sure what people were talking about. We have a crisis of home building, but from an affordability standpoint, this was about as good as it got. And then of course, nobody's lived through a 400 point, well, I take that back, I have, but half the population of Hawaii has never lived in a time when the 30 year fixed rate mortgage rate went up four percentage points. That, that hasn't happened for almost 40, you know, 35, 40 years. So, I mean, if you were around back then, you remember what that was like, but nobody today has any recent memory of that. And that blasted the housing market. And you can, you know, that's what's causing prices to fall. Here's what it's doing to home sales. So yeah, that you're going over the cliff, uh, over the Niagara Falls in a, in a barrel. And that's, you know, uh, come back six months from now and 
interest rates will probably come down. Yeah, by the way, interest rates went from four, 3% a year ago to 7% in November. They're back to 6% now. They'll be in the fives for most of this year. They got a good shot at going into the high fours. I think they'll stop, uh, you know, four and a half to five percent should probably be the equal it's not going back to three but hey better than seven so so that's come and then it'll go and the inflation will go away we can talk about that if you want okay second houses are not going to be inexpensive in hawaii okay why because it's hawaii right it's not west virginia it's not iowa right they weren't cheap 50 years ago they're not cheap today they're not going to be cheap you may have more of them that aren't cheap, that, that aren't expensive if you build them, which we used to, and we'll come back to that in a second. But basically the path of median prices, if we were looking at those data, this is like a slightly different series. This is something the federal government publishes, an index of housing valuations. They take all the sales data, they take all the collateral valuations in mortgage-backed securities, right? So every time you refi the how you originate a mortgage or you refi, right? There's a there's a value associated with that house on that date in that location, and we see that at different points in time because you know people refi, people add on to their house, people you know move and all this other stuff. And here's the pattern to start thinking about the dynamic pattern to start thinking about. Over time, there's an escalator, maybe two percent per annum. And I, I start this math sometime in the 80s when the inflation environment, you see that when that inflation environment came down about 30, 40 years ago and, and gradually worked its way down to the zone where we're in now, about 2%, except when Russia invades Ukraine. Um, I mean, and that's the environment we're gonna go back to, 2% inflation uh, in the remainder of the 2020s, maybe later this year. I mean, we're at 5% now, if you're benchmarking, if you're measuring, uh, urban Hawaii inflation last month was 5.1%, and two is the number, and the number is two. So we'll get the two sometime this year or next. Well, 2% inflation plus 2% real appreciation, these are inflation adjusted valuations, that's 4%. Two plus two is four, and 4% 4 is what single family home prices were yielding or in terms of appreciation um, over the last decade. So we've actually kind of been on this path. We had a little mini bubble from COVID is now unwinding. It hasn't shown up in these data, but those big bubbles in the past are probably behind us, but it's important to think about those bubbles. It's th important to think about the roller coaster we had in the past in these valuations and how that informs what should we be doing because we throttled, we throttled with regulatory policy in Hawaii, with zoning and all this other jazz, inclusionary zoning, we throttled the supply response. So now, I'm sorry, you have to look at the data. The data are in the upper left-hand corner. These are all the units authorized by building permit in all four counties for 70 years. I'm sorry, I don't have more than 70 years of data, but if you're a millennial and you're thinking about why this matters, your entire adult life has existed in a world in which there was so little housing built over the last decade or 12 or 13 years, on average, statewide, only World War was worse. Let me say that again, or Korean War, right? But basically the 50s, in the 50s, we built more housing in Hawaii than we did in the last decade without computers. You see what I mean? And if you decompose the data into these components, the cycle, the trend, and a residual and noise component, it's not, it doesn't bode well for the future because the trend is downward and those cycles, there's a good, like the good news is that the cycles have gotten, um, you know, the roller coaster ride has gotten smoother and this goes back that, see that valuation path? Sorry, see those cycles? This is values and here's production. And now I've detrended the production. So you see the, the cycle around the trend while well, the trend is going down. And then there's a noise component. Well, we can do this for Oahu. We can do this for the neighbor islands. I'm sorry, what the heck is this? Oh, this is the higher frequency date, right? These are annual, these are quarterly, these are quarterly for Oahu, these are quarterly for the neighbor islands, right? I'll just point out a couple things. Look at the quarterly trend for Oahu. 
it, there's that break around 1980 something happened in the 70s so this is an, what's called an endogenous break in the time series i didn't i didn't make it up it just you know i make the math do it for me you can see those cycles look how the new urbanism cycle of the Oh, here, let me make the arrow go around here. This I was referring to this earlier, where we had kind of a renaissance of condo building and the urban core. Well, compare that to the neighbor islands, where they just crushed home building in the like 50% affordable housing price. Wow, that was what hey, bro, 50% of nothing is nothing, bro. So that's what happened over on the neighbor islands. And so let me wrap up. This is this is really the this the part that's going to make your brain hurt. So three stylized facts. The, the two cycles move together, right? The valuation cycle and the, right, this production cycle. And they're pretty much the same way. The catch away where we built a lot of homes, the Japan bubble where we had an extraordinary exogenous factor at work, the subprime bubble, another period where a different set of exogenous factors, the new urbanism of the, of the 20 teens. And now we'll see, there's probably another cycle out here in the in the in the 2020s and you know we sort of want to make it a robust cycle in the sense that you know we want to build more but on the other hand we don't you know we don't want to clamp it down but on the other hand we you know want to get crazy we want to have you know manage it and have it built people build in the right places but they got to build and let, just give any idea about the numbers i'm talking about here look at these look at these uh let's look at the annual data right if you're up at eight to ten thousand units a year right, when the boomers are all graduating from high school. Well, that's maybe more than you need. But 4,000, bro, that's not enough. So I'm thinking if you're not hitting six to 8,000, I mean, that's just the rough, the crude math. You're not hitting six to 8,000 units a year. Bro, you're not even making it. And then add it up over what, 20, 30, 40 years where you've been off by 2,000 units a year, like for 40, 50 years, was it 1973 and 2020? That's 50 years times 2,000 units minimum. Try three. Well, that's like 100,000 units you're behind. Okay, let me, let me get to that point in just a second. Three stylized facts. Price movements cause home building. But if you restrict the home building supply response, it amplifies the valuation, valuation cycle and it cuts off the affordability. That's what people are concerned about, getting the opportunity cut off and if you look over 80 years of data, and we have now 80 years of data, finally, I've been waiting for 40 years, so now we have 80 years of data, turns out the more you build, the lower the prices. That's a fact, Jack. So let me go through, one, two, three. There are those detrended cycles, we already saw them, the building cycle, the valuation cycle, put them together, and you might say, hey, bro, chicken and egg, which came first? It turns out, you can run a statistical test, prices, cause a ranger cause production so when prices go up that's a signal for people to produce and if you throttle that response if you choke it out then the prices have to clear the market faster and it cuts off the affordability now we did a little better in the 20 teens we see that where the the valuations didn't go above trend close to that four percent trend or two percent in real terms they said really close to that trend we're going to keep doing that but we got to catch up for the previous 50 years for the hundred thousand units we were supposed to build but didn't because we were so busy throttling the production and this is more details but basically the right if the supply curve is steep it it, it has a less elastic response right if prices go up but quantities don't go up as much you're not making it and we blew it for like 30 40 years and we kind of got better in the 20 teens. I'm thinking this response, right? If prices go up, detrended prices go up. What, what are these? Are these constant? These are constant dollars, right? $10,000, $20,000 in, in 2022 dollars. Then there ought to be an extra 2,000 units being built, not 200. So we've got to get to a, you, that sounds crazy, I know, because it's Hawaii. And we've so, Half of you haven't lived in a world where people could build that many units. When I graduated from high school, 18,000 units were authorized by building permit 50 years ago when I graduated high school. That's not going to happen this year. So you look at the historical data. I got 80 years of data. The downward slope says, right, the more you build, the lower the median price. And, okay, and this is the hardest thing of all to get into our heads. Somebody cut you off in the 1970s. I don't know who it was, 
they're probably not even alive, or if they are, you know, living off a state pension or something. But this is these are Wahoo data. I only have a Wahoo data for 100 years. I don't have neighbor island data. But you see this point I was making, right? We're building so few houses nowadays that, you know, World War II, I mean, the, the post-war period was as good as it is now. I know Senator Chang has spent a lot of time looking at alternative housing policy and housing management models. So there's a few years we all kind of studied Singapore together. And more recently, he's been studying Vienna. This is ironic because I went to school in Vienna 50 years ago. And so I kind of know what, you know, a little bit about what's going on. I know a lot about the history. And uh, sadly, uh, or actually, it's great because I love it, art history, but it doesn't exactly, you know, help with math and economics. Um, here's one of the problems that's in our head. We think of starting from the current benchmark, which turns out to be three persons per housing unit. When we do, when, you know, when DBED, or my homies at SMS Research for the HHHHHHFDC, right? When they do all these housing studies and how much housing units we need, brother? And they go, well, if you take three persons per unit, you need dollar tree 80 or whatever. They come up with these numbers, right? 50,000 units. But Vienna has two persons per housing unit. Let me let that sink in for a second. Three persons per unit versus two persons per unit. Vienna has really interesting social housing policies and management structures, really interesting. And trust me, trust me, I've lived there. They know what they're doing. And they had our problem 100 years ago after World War I in the 1920s. And you know what they did? They built choke houses. But uh, the, the problem is our perspective is the wrong starting point. You can't start from the standpoint of San Francisco or San Jose or Honolulu at three persons per unit and say, oh, you know, how are we going to do? What HSHDC going to do? Or how many H's get in front? Anyway, add some more H's in front. And then they, what you going to do, bro? No, you need like, my calculation, 160,000 units will get you to where Vienna is. And then you can do social housing policy. When I look at what the state has planned, so this is, I went to the HFD, HHHHFDC, like plan, and here the links are in the bottom, so you can go look it up yourself for 2020. And then from my homies at the Honolulu Board of Realtors, right? I got the data, I got every transaction. So here's the distribution of HHHHHFDC's home building plan. And then here's the distribution of prices. And here's the problem. You see this puka inside the middle, right? HHHHHFDC, you know, H to the N FDCs housing plan and the state's housing policy legitimately are focused right on the Alice people. Al you know, those guys, Alice, bro, they tell us, hey, bro, you know what? The lowest 20% and the second lowest 20%, bro, they have income below the median. No lie, bro. That's, that's not the, the definition of the median. Anyway, right? They're focused on the low end. That's appropriate. But here's what the problem is. I know how much housing demand there is in the middle where people, regular people live between $300,000 a unit and like $700,000 a unit. That's where, and look at that puka. There's no way the state's ever gonna build in there. There's no way those units, if, you're, if your solution is inclusionary zoning, there's no way those units can cross subsidize. The low, right, they're, they're just middle-class units. You can't jack those guys to pay for the poor people. And there's no way you can subsidize sufficiently not to get to another 100,000 or 150,000 units. You would, not, you would need not just a Vienna style social, dem social democracy, social housing management strategy, but you would need to build 100 to 150,000 units. So just to review, short term, the impact of remote work is here to stay. Working from home is here to stay. Small kind, maybe, Used to be 10%, maybe now it's 20% of the workforce, but they're working at home. That means 10% of the office space downtown. Wow, no need. And bro, if you see how often the UPS guy comes by my neighborhood, I'm not sure we need all the shopping malls we got either. I'm just saying there are gonna be some changes. Maybe these are places that can be converted uh, to housing. This spillover to the suburbs, the exurbs and Zoom towns, the right, the, the donut effect that it created some backwash. So, 
housing demand remains vigorous within the urban core. There's a lifestyle thing, particularly for younger workers, particularly people who value their time and don't want to waste it in commutes, right? So the backwash is there. Most recently, we've had this Federal Reserve monetary policy fight against inflation and, uh, you know, the artifacts of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And, and you know, avian flu, bro. Stop bitching about eggs. It's avian flu. So maybe get rid of the chickens in Kailua because pff, that's avian flu right there, the avian flu pool. But I'm just saying things happen. You got to use monetary policy to deal with it. Unfortunately, monetary policy can't fix the problems faced by the Ukrainian people but they can reduce the pressure that's leading to some of the inflation. And that was coming from the housing market. And so we're seeing that unfolding, that will go away in the next year. So by 2024, we're gonna have to have our act together. We're not gonna have a state surplus because we're gonna waste it on stupid stuff, speed humps or whatever. And we need to move forward. And we can't possibly solve these problems with government housing, with, subsidies, tax credits, all this other stuff. Um, you got to have the, you got to activate the private sector. You got to let them know what the envelope is. Here's the boundaries. Here's where you can build now, not 10 years from now, when I finish my study on where we can build at the train station, but the train station is housing. It should be housing, right? Mass transit is about housing. It's not about transportation. And we can pick up from those points, but I'll, I'll just stop there for now and get on with the Q&A before I blow people's minds any further. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for an incredibly detailed and data-rich presentation. That was really fascinating, and um, I personally learned a lot. Um, I'm going to start with a question that's a very common one that we get whenever we do public presentations, which is that there seems to be a trend, at least in the public perception, that housing that we do build is lost to wealthy overseas investors, vacation rentals, or other offshore buyers, which creates phenomena like these dark towers in places like Kaka'ako. Uh, maybe more recently, we have um, remote workers coming in um, during the pandemic. How large is that effect on these trends? Yes, the myth, myth of the evil offshore workers. So tomorrow I will get on a plane, I will go to the mainland, and for the next six weeks, except when I commute back to Hawaii for meetings, I will be working remotely from North America. So what, bada you? I mean, really, is that a problem with you? Should, should the people where I'm gonna be working be all hoo hoo because I'm not from around there because I changed the character of their neighborhood. WTF, what are people talking about? First of all, wait, then the share of local buyers increased during the decade pre COVID. So, how could that make if I don't even understand the logic, right? Oh, just too many mainland guys. And they bid up the price. Yeah, bro, where those guys live, mostly you don't live. And either way, we could just build the units. That's the other thing I don't understand. Oh, the unit's dark. Oh, Brubaker's not going to be sleeping in his bed. Wow, that's wrong, bro. For six weeks, he's not going to be at his... Oh, bro, that's wrong. It's just, I don't even understand where that comes from. Just build the units. That's, that's my answer. It's, it's just not even true that foreign and mainland buyer shares have been increasing. They've been decreasing. So how could a decreasing share of offshore buyers make affordability worse, particularly when affordability didn't get worse? <laughs> it only got worse the last 12 months because of interest rates. So while everybody was worried about this, the darkened condos and the, you know, you're completely missing the point. We're not, building enough, right? Capiche, that's what's going on. These are the data. You can go look at the data, 80 to 85% of all the transactions on Oahu are local buyers. You know how many mainland Chinese, Pake, China, China, Chinese buyers? 
of condos there were in Honolulu in the 15 years ending in 20 or pre-COVID, 0.2%, 0.2%. So get off that subject and let's move to something that actually matters. And like I say, the data, this is public data, you can just go download the data. Let's, let's focus on something constructive and not on something that sounds mildly xenophobic. I mean, what's up with that? Are they not from around here? Who talks like that? Thank you for that uh, very colorful answer, Paul. Um, so we have a question from the audience about renting versus ownership. And I might also mm. add leasehold um, because that's something that we've talked about. That's the Singaporean model. As you know, Vienna does the renter model. And um, here in America, we have this American dream of home ownership. Um, how do you think that those different types of tenure affect the housing market? So first of all, I don't know how many times I can beat this. Okay. The, the model is independent of how many units you have. Singapore has a model that's consistent with its culture and history or the, the, the particular multicultural milieu comprising the Singaporean, the modern post-colonial Singaporean. Vienna has, again, as a multi-ethnic, multicultural society going back in recorded history to, you know, the death of Marcus, Marcus Aurelius in Vindobana. I mean, it's, there's a lot of history there, a lot of different cultures, and they have um, and, and a lot of political history ranging from social democracy to fascism and back to social democracy or absolutism to social democracy to fascism to social democracy. Right-wingers are, you know, close to winning elections these days. But the systems for managing and even the tenure systems to which you alluded a second ago, are independent of whether you have enough units, right? This is the picture, right? If you have 40% more housing units per person, it's, it's easy to solve or craft the, the policy or management solution to fit your cultural or historical um, preferences or you know, this is social welfare. But you need to have 50, 40 to 50% more units per person to even make that feasible. And we know where the gap is between what the state reasonably can be expected. I mean, I, I'm not saying, saying it's unreasonable for, for the state to be focused on the low end of the housing spectrum. That's the, 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 you know, they're fulfilling our aspirations for helping out uh, uh, needy households, but there's a huge puka in the middle. And the only way we can realistically fill that is by uh, getting private capital working and private builders in there. Even even the military, when it privatized its the housing base housing units on Oahu, took about 15 years. About 17,000 housing units were converted, right? Um, and that's a that's a leasehold system. That's an interesting uh, parallel. But even those guys outsourced the whole thing to private developers, right? Because the Department of Defense is not in the housing business. It's it's, it's really straightforward. Now, with respect to the specifics of residential leasehold land tenure. We've got a track record on that and it's not good in Hawaii. And you can see it, it's happening in Waiholi Valley right now, again, right? So what's the expression insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results, right? I, I mean, I know Senator Chang, you've been intrigued at how Singapore has managed to make that work, but, it, you know, and many of you aren't alive, but if you weren't alive back in the day, but if you go back and look at the political conflicts and land reform in the 60s, but especially the 70s and the early 80s, and I came home, you know, I was a kid that I came home at the tail end of that litigation, and I actually participated as an expert witness in one of these cases, it was like the, the crumbs at the end, you know, I think people were telling me, you're gonna make so much money, and that was the, the last case ever. But the point is, leasehold land tenure is an intertemporally inefficient contractual format when it's set up the way we've customarily adopt, uh, you know, uh, designed it here in Hawaii. There's only one place in the nation that's done that 
let's try that. And I, for some reason, Lord Baltimore put it in some will or something or anybody. So somewhere around Baltimore, they, they tried it out. It, I don't know what the track record is there, but here it was pretty much a train wreck. It was the way the landowners approached this in the early post-war period. And they all had to you know, convert to fee simple under state law, but also just to stop the craziness. And now the craziness is, is happening in the very place it happened 50 years ago, which is Waholi Valley, for the very same reasons. These contracts are very difficult to design, so they make sense over time. You know that that escalator with the roller coaster around it? The, the, you, you know, you may think there's a long-term equilibrium dynamic trajectory, but you don't know which side you're going to be on in the cycle from time, you know, moment to moment. And here we are. Did you know a year ago that Russia was going to invade Ukraine? Well, maybe a year ago tomorrow, you see what I mean? But I mean, that's the kind of world we live in. And so what happens in commercial real estate, where this is much more prevalent, is the tenure of the land, you know, of the leases is relatively short. So you, every five or 10 years, right, you're, you're getting a mark to market, so to speak. You get, you get a valuation and everybody can see what the value is and you agree and then set the rent and you move on. But with residential land tenure, the lease terms have tended to be really long. And then inevitably, if there's a, you know, 30 year initial period or something where the rent doesn't change, it's after 30 years, it's completely out of whack. And by the way, towards the end of the lease term, nobody's putting in money and a maintenance. And so, okay, it hasn't really worked. I, and, and of course, fee simple works just fine. It's just, we're not building enough. We're not building enough of it here in the middle. Now I can make a list for you of the people who will build in the middle here in Honolulu. It's a shorter list than it was 20, 30 years ago. The Zobug is all left. They said, what? You guys are crazy. And, but there's a few people left around and there would be more if we could figure out how to make that, that work. It's, it's got a, it requires density, right? It's gonna be a lot more rental format than the condo uh, fee simple ownership format or both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And by the way, I know this is an issue for you, Senator Chang, but the reality, just as the financial instruments have changed, just as the nature of finance has changed in, in you know, housing finance, the players have changed. So the REITs are big players in this area, right? They're these pass-through structures. They're, they're, they used to be you know, rich buggers who lived on Diamond Head. Right. Every time I drive by somebody, somebody Weinberg Foundation, hey, bless their hearts. Well, you know, wealthy guys used to be the landlords 60, 70 years ago. A couple, you know, a couple missionary descendants or something, you know, some couple of Lee kind of guys or whatever. But no, it's all mutual funds now. And the problem is we're thinking about how to, you know, how we should think of the tax treatment of S Corps, right? S Corps build buildings. C corps manage them right because of passing through the rents, and um, that you know that's an issue. We're, we're going to need the financial players, as well as the density, sort of an urban core for. You know, we can't build, we can't radiate outward across the prairie like the U in Iowa, right? So now, wake up! It's the 2020s. We're talking about the urban core, right? There's never going to be another. They're never going to build a freeway. They're never going to extend H2 freeway to Y and I. So that's never going to happen. So we're done with that conurbation or suburbation or whatever you call it. And we got to focus on the urban core. And the city, having spent too much money, no doubt, uh, has created bandwidth along which creative people might actually. But okay, getting to the middle is the issue. And these land tenure alternatives have been very problematic. If you can make it work, knock yourself out. And there may be places they do work, and there may be circumstances they work, particularly when the public is, you know, public sector is involved. But my beef with, I've heard this talking to housing officials, state housing officials, and they like to say, oh yeah, but that's our land at the train station. I'm like, no bro, this land is your land. This land is my land, right? This is our land. We, the people own that land. So you can't give it away right? Because it's, you already own it. So it's free. No, you already own it. So it has a value, which if you sold it, you could get, and then you could build more affordable housing. You see this down in Kaka'ako where they go, oh, bro, you got to build 20% affordable units. I'm like, in Kaka'ako? 
product. And Kakako, they ain't going to be affordable. That's the most expensive land on the island. You could just sell that land and go buy choke land at the train station Waipahu and build your affordable housing at the train station. Do them a favor. How much housing is being built at train stations right now? Here, count it up. How much housing being built at the train station? Well, the train station already there. How much housing? Zero. That's how much is being built at the train station after 15 years where you didn't know the train was coming. Why? Because they don't even know. You go talk to the city. What are the rules for building around train station? Well, you don't know. Go talk to the state. Well, we're going to do a plan. You know, we're going to do a plan. No, bro. The train station is a condo. That's the way to think about it. Well, we only have a couple minutes left. So um, let me try to ask one question that is open-ended and maybe we can get your feedback. So you've already pointed out some of the perils of leasehold um, historically here in Hawaii. Um, you know, we also know that giving carte blanche to developers politically is very unpopular. Um, you talked about high density near train stations. You know, this Oha Kaka'ako Makai proposal has been very controversial. So has Kui Lei Place, which is another high density urban infill type project. Um, could you come up just with a few um, politically realistic solutions that would move the needle on that big you know, gap that you identified yeah. in the housing market at the three hundred dollars to seven hundred thousand dollar level. I, I alluded to aspects of it, but I don't have specifics. I'm, as you say, I think that's something we're going to have to thrash out. So it is an open ended question. But here's the general principle I have in mind: is boundaries, right? Boundaries and then bandwidth. So let me explain. The boundary is right at the end of the urban land use district. We're done. On Oahu, there isn't even a rural district. After that is agriculture. But we're done, just think of the city. Once, once you're a half hour commute, it's not worth commuting, not on Oahu. In Manhattan, it's worth an hour. But yeah, this is Honolulu, it's not the same. And we're at that boundary. So we kind of, we're 28 minutes and then we went to 25. We're gonna go back to 28. So you've got to build within the urban boundary, but that means you have to build at higher density. If you look at the opening slide of this uh, of this uh, presentation, let's just go back all the way to the first slide, right? Look at all of this part of the urban core. Okay, now, now the neighborhood is gonna be all PO at me for saying this, but it seems to me that within the urban core or in, in, in you know along the along the Kapilani, I'm sorry, the King Street and Baratania corridors, we have to worry about sea rise and Kapilani, unfortunately, you know, we might be a place we have to worry about, but we're not on a King Street. But I'm just saying, if you go to most European cities and most Asian cities where density is actually the, the solution, there aren't two story walk-ups along a corridor like the King Street Baratania corridor, right? There are at least four to six. And right, right off the top, you would triple, triple the housing capacity and in those cases, I specifically mentioned those cases because here's a tip. Where do the number one, two, and three bus lines go? And why are they the number one, two, and three, the bus line? Okay, so that's already, so that's one concept. Then you have the, the rail corridor now, which may never get to Kakako, but probably, you know, at least going to create an, an agglomeration node stretching from Ho'opili, but not Kapolei, stretching from Ho'opili, you know, maybe to the, to the uh, stadium area, um, past the airport, you know, it, we'll see how far it goes. I'm just saying, you know, uh, Dillingham, we hope, yeah, but it's already there. So the boundaries, as I say, are already there, but then the bandwidth has to be in the middle. And what we, the, the principle is how do we agree on that, you know, respecting the trade-off that the boundary is a boundary. So I hate to say it to OHA, which by the way, surely you knew in 2012 when you acquired the land that you couldn't build high-rise housing there. I mean, what was your first clue? But I'm just saying a, a, a similar principle would be, I thought it was, Makai of Alamana Boulevard, Pau. Right, the density is on year after from 2006 and forever after is Malka only of 
Ala Moana Boulevard, or as we'll know it in 20 years, the Ala Moana Dyke. You know what I mean? Because the sea rise. And the sim, sa, same principle along the spine of the, the urban corridor, because this, this is not a city that radially expands across flat land. It, it follows this curved South Shore spine as far as Ho'opili, but not Kapolei. It doesn't actually get to the second city. Um, that's where it makes sense to me to put the focus on creating bandwidth and the reason why the boundaries need to be, right? If you, if you keep moving the boundary, then you undermine the credibility of the concept of a boundary, right? If you keep moving the urban boundary, well, we're not doing that anymore. I think we're, it's pretty clear to everybody that I talk to uh, that, um, you know, Ho'opili and Ko'orid, that's it, we're done. Uh, now there's a different issue on the neighbor islands, which by the way, just, you know, they're big islands. They're way bigger than Oahu, you know what I mean? So, but I'll leave, they can duke that out amongst themselves. I'm just saying, if we're talking about the urban core, which I think it makes sense to talk about because of that boundary issue, then that you, you can't have a successful strategy even if you have a credible commitment to the boundary, unless you create the bandwidth, the way to build inside at higher density. And a good place to start would just be, look around at the closest bus stop and think of what a six story building would look like. Because that's what probably ought to be there. And now I'm not talking about Kapahulu anymore. I'm talking about Kailua town. How come nobody lives in Kailua town? You know what else? Nobody walks in Kailua town. They get in their car at whole paychecks and they drive to Tarje. It's like, what kind of a town is that? So that's going on in all of our neighbors. I live in Kailua, so I live outside Kailua, but I'm just saying it's a conversation that has to happen in every neighborhood and every neighborhood is just like Kailua and Manoa, right? They're all like, get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> you know, like, right? You can't build apartments on top of Liberty House in Kailua. You can put a gym, but you can't put apartments. You can't put three more floors. So I'm just saying that's probably where we have to duke it out is within the boundaries. But you can't have boundaries and then say no bandwidth because that's just no and no. The answer is no and no. And we've been doing that for 50 years. And that's why people are living. 1973, go check it out. Something like 13,700 authorizations by building permit for housing units on Oahu and another four or 5,000 on the neighbor islands 50 years ago. And today, this year, what, what was it last year? Not even 5,000. And it's not going to be 5,000 this year. So we got to figure out a way, I don't know, 15,000 maybe is too much, but we got to be able to hit double what we're doing now, or it's just a waste of everybody's time. Bruh, People are dying without ever having, right? They're just gone. They left, right? Or they're 40 something living with their parents. Woo so that's, that's the challenge to me. Boundaries and bandwidth. I don't have the solution. I just have a concept in mind. And remember before this, we just sprawled. Okay, we're done with that but you can't be done with sprawl and not go into the core. We don't have 2000 years of history to figure it out like, like Vienna did or 5,000 years of history, like all the Chinese guys and all the Chinese developers in Singapore always tell me, oh, we have 5,000 years of history. I'm like, okay, well, we'll put that aside. And, and you can see what they've done in Singapore, bro. They got the mass transit system connected to all the condo towers and the, the, the stations are, malls and the condos are on top of that so that was always the concept behind um frank fossey's rail system back in the day that was 50 years ago and uh that was the concept when it revived briefly in the 80s right the reen moncho train i worked with guys who were gonna develop at the at the pensacola and the kapilani kalakawa sort of you know sort of the anchor stations the train in those days was going to go to uh and it was all about density that everybody's strategy was the train station is a retail galleria extended from all center with condos 
Uh, Don Graham taught me that. Old Don Graham, who built Alamana Center in the 1950s. So these are not new ideas. And there's some good ones out there. And if you can get, if you can get lease older work, knock yourself out. It probably will work in some places under some circumstances. But Fee Simple works really well. And there's an entire financial institutional mechanism. And it's all fintech, you know. A majority of mortgages in America are originated online. So it's the algorithms and they're designed. Is there collateral, right? Is there fee simple collateral? Is there a FICO score we can, you got a paycheck, you got a track record, making your monthly payments, boom. Single mom paid your rent on time for three years, boom, there you go. So I say exploit the system to build where we already know we probably have to within the, the urban boundary. That's more expensive and it's harder to do. And you gotta have a conversation with the neighbors but you can't just spend 50 years having conversations and not doing anything. And that's sort of where we leave off now and literally handing it off to the next generation. Well, on that note, Paul, thank you so much. You, um, you really inspired a lot of discussion. Unfortunately, we have, we can't get to the many additional questions that were asked by our audience. Um, but like I said, we'll be happy to distribute the slides that you presented today to our audience. Please. And um, we look forward to having future discussions with you in the, uh, in the days to come and the years to come. So thank and you again. Keep fighting the good fight down there, uh, Senator Chang. Thank you, Paul. All right. Have a good night, everyone.